Hey guys, welcome back. If you're new here, hi. My name is Jessica and welcome to my channel where I explore new true crime or creepy history topics each week. Last week we talked about Rochelle Waterman and her boyfriend Jason and honestly their whole thing is just a big ass mess. So if you're interested, I'll make sure to have the video linked up here in the card for you. And if you just have an interest in true crime or the macabre in general and you'd like to join me back here each week, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. So when I was working on the Lacey Spears case, I realized, and I actually think I mentioned in that video, that I've covered quite a few really terrible mothers on my channel, but I have yet to cover any bad dads. I mean, some of the men that I've covered have been dads, but their crimes didn't necessarily center around them being just horrible fathers. And I figured there had to be some out there, and <laughs> boy is there. So with that said, let's talk about some shitty dads. And we'll kick it off with a man named Carl Carlson. Have you ever heard of him? If not, fair warning, he really sucks. Like, a lot. So let's get into it. Carl Holger Carlson was born on January 17th, 1960, into a very well-respected family in Seneca County, New York. He was a fairly average student. He maintained passing grades in high school before enlisting in the Air Force following his graduation in the late 1970s. And it was while stationed in North Dakota for the Air Force that Carl met a young woman by the name of Christina Alexander. And these two fell hard and fast for one another. Christina even told her sister just two months into their relationship that she was falling in love with Carl. They were married in the early 80s and began their family in North Dakota shortly thereafter. They had a daughter named Erin in 1984 and a son named Levi in 1985. Carl was also discharged from the Air Force in 1985, which prompted the family to make a really big change. They packed up Carl's old pickup truck and they hauled their children 25 hours from North Dakota to Carl's hometown of Seneca Falls, New York. And while living in New York, the Carlsons welcomed their third and final child, a daughter named Katie in 1987. Christina loved being a mother, and she and Carl's relationship seemed blissfully happy. They were always laughing and joking with one another, and given their stark contrast in size, people thought they made a really cute couple. Carl worked at the local stone quarry to support his family. However, he very quickly felt unfulfilled in that line of work. He just always felt as though his true future lied elsewhere. And he was pretty open about these feelings to those closest to him, which ultimately led Christina's father to offer him a job at his heating and cooling business in California. Carl happily accepted the position, and once again, he and Christina packed up their family, but this time they moved clear across the country to Murphy's, California. This seemed like a really great arrangement. Carl was super excited for his new job, and Christina was super excited to finally be closer to her family. The only person more more excited than the Carlsons was Christina's sister, Colette. She and Christina had always been extremely close. They'd always dreamt of raising their families together, and now with Christina so close, those dreams were starting to look like their new reality. But this new reality was not immediately glamorous for Christina. Despite the fact that Christina's father, Art, had offered the Carlsons a rental home of his free of charge, Carl was determined to provide for his own family, so instead he set out to find them their very own home. And, I mean, he found one, if you want to call it that. He moved his family into what they now describe as a rundown old miner's shack. But rather than complain, Christina just made the most of things. She handmade curtains, she painted, she decorated. She did everything she possibly could to make their new house feel like a real and genuine family home. And what's more impressive is she did it all with an unwavering smile on her face. Aaron and Katie remember always being happy when they were with their mother. Christina would take the children on walks and they'd collect like acorns and leaves. And when they got home, they'd press them into these little like adventure book things they had. Or they'd go on trips to town to get ice cream or candy. It just really seems like Christina did her best to make every single day as special for her children as she possibly could. But on the flip side of that, the Carlson's daughters remember always feeling tense and on edge whenever they were around their father. He was temperamental and strict, and despite Christina's best efforts to keep it from her children, he was very obviously becoming verbally abusive towards their mother. Christina really did her best to appear happy in front of her friends, her family, and her children, but the longer the couple was around Christina's family, the more cracks began to form in the facade of their happy marriage. 
Colette specifically recalls the moment that she realized that something was very, very wrong with her sister's husband. It was Christina's 30th birthday, and she was super excited because she had an appointment to go and get a set of those, like, old, vintage glamour shots done. You know, those photo shoots with the big bangs and the flashy outfits and the heavy makeup that people would get done back in, like, the 80s and 90s? Yeah, she was going to go and get those done as, like, a birthday present to herself. She took her time getting ready. She carefully applied her makeup and meticulously coiffed her hair. But just before she was about to leave for her photo shoot with Colette, Carl's dusty ass walked in and told her that she, quote, looked like a whore and needed to remove her makeup immediately. Douche. And poor Christina, probably just heartbroken because I know I would have been. She just retreated to the bathroom and did as she was told. I don't know about you, but that story makes me so sad. I cannot possibly imagine how I would feel if my husband ever spoke to me like that, let alone right before something that I was so incredibly excited for. I told you he sucks. Understandably so, from that moment on, Colette had a very low opinion of Carl. And to be frank, I don't think that Christina was his number one fan either. According to Colette in late 1990, Christina had actually made plans to leave Carl. She was going to take the children and temporarily move in with Colette until she could get a fresh start. She just wanted to wait until after the holidays. She did not want to turn her children's worlds upside down right before Christmas. But unfortunately, that decision would prove fatal for Christina. Because on January 1st, 1991, Christina would find herself trapped in their family bathroom when their home went up in flames. Carl would claim he was working in the garage when he first heard Christina screaming, and that when he emerged from the garage, he saw smoke billowing from their house, and that he immediately sprang into action. He first broke the windows to the children's rooms in order to pull them to safety, but he was unable to reach Christina because the window to the bathroom had coincidentally been boarded up just days before the fire. When asked about this, Carl explained that the window had been sticking, and that Christina had broken it on accident when she tried to open it with a plunger. Carl then volunteered his hypothesis as to how the fire may have started. You see, what had happened was, a couple of days before the fire, their dog and cat had been roughhousing around the house and spilled a jug of kerosene that the Carlsons had planned to use in their kerosene heater. You know how pets are, always just (laughs) spilling the accelerant? Anyways, Carl assumed that the kerosene must have ignited when a lamp he was using to do some housework had fallen on it and exposed it to heat. And yes, this story is on my channel, so obviously we know it's a crock of shit. But initially, investigators had no reason to doubt it. I mean, it's a series of extremely unfortunate coincidences, sure. But at first, most people took the story at face value. Christina's family, on the other hand, felt very differently. Some of her cousins even took it upon themselves to go to the house and videotape the conditions of the scene, just in case they ever needed it in the future. The video really highlights just how distraught Christina's family is at the fact that Carl did not do more to try and save his wife. And you can see in the video that even though Carl swore that the fire had completely taken over the house and that there was no way he could have possibly saved Christina, that in actuality, the bathroom was virtually untouched by the fire. Christina's cause of death wasn't even determined to have actually been the flames. She had actually died from smoke inhalation. She was found in the fetal position in front of the bathtub, clutching a rag over her face. The more everyone learned about the fire, the more it looked like Carl could have actually very easily saved Christina's life. Why hadn't he simply pried the board out of the window? He says he couldn't have possibly done that because it was nailed in with like 18 nails, but right before the fire, he was working in the garage, so wouldn't he have had access to plenty of tools? Once the children were safe, wouldn't you think he'd at least try? Even if the outcome ultimately ended up the same, at least you put in some effort. But instead, the children recall Carl telling them that their mother had gone to heaven before firefighters or first responders had even made it on scene. Obviously, that was the outcome he was hoping for, but damn, to just say it out loud like that before anyone could possibly know for sure? What a sociopath. It shouldn't be surprising that Carl's demeanor following Christina's death is remembered as cold and inappropriate. He just didn't seem emotional or really bothered at all by his wife's passing. That being said, I find it incumbent to mention that every person on planet Earth handles grief, trauma, or loss differently. And judgments made based off of someone's affect following a tragedy can easily be highly inaccurate. 
And although Christina had passed in the fire, a lot of people still revered Carl as a hero. I mean, he did save his three children, but for every person who admired his supposed bravery, it seemed there was at least one person who conversely found the whole situation more than just a little sus. Honestly though, nobody's opinion, good or bad, mattered to Carl because he was not long for California. Just four days after the fire, like we're talking the remains of the home are probably still warm. Carl packed up his children and moved back to New York. Y'all, Christina's family was pissed. Not only did they just lose their beloved sister and daughter, and not only were they highly suspicious of the circumstances surrounding her death, but on top of this, they're now losing their last remaining link to that loved one by losing her children. Talk about being kicked while you're down. Following Christina's death, state fire examiner Carl Kent was sent out to the property to investigate what had happened and try and determine the validity of Carl's story. He noted a very strong kerosene odor throughout the home and that given the burn patterns, the fire had definitely originated outside of the bathroom door. This meant Christina had been boxed in. She had virtually no chance of making it out of the home. Forensic electrical engineer Ken Buskey also inspected the conditions of the fire and was able to determine that the light Carl claimed to have started the fire wasn't even on when it fell on the carpet. Therefore, it would have been emitting precisely no heat and would have had exactly zero ability to ignite a fire, no matter how much accelerant was on the carpet. He determined that the fire had undoubtedly been started by a human and not by the lamp. Yet somehow the district attorney did not believe that they had enough to prosecute Carl. It was just case closed. And once the case was in fact closed and ruled as an accident, Carl was able to collect the $200,000 life insurance policy he'd taken out on Christina just 19 days before her death, which would be equivalent to about $403,000 today. Yeah. He settled back in New York with his kids and his small fortune. He got a job working at the local glass manufacturer. And as far as he was concerned, life was good. He even moved on romantically pretty quickly. The year was 1992. Carl was kicking back, unwinding at a local country western bar when he set his sights on 26-year-old Cindy Best. You see, Cindy was trying to find herself a line dancing partner. Carl pretended he knew diddly shit about line dancing. It became immediately apparent upon hitting the dance floor that he actually did not, and the rest was history. It was just your average rom-com meet cute, except with Stetsons, probably, I don't know. Not important, the two began dating and they became serious pretty quickly, which is apparently a trend for Carl. But honestly, everyone seemed really happy about the relationship. Not only were Carl's children thrilled at the prospect of having a mother figure in their life again, but Cindy, who believed she was unable to conceive her own children, was very drawn to this like ready-made family. The couple was married in August of 1993, and they purchased Carl's family's old farmhouse as their new family home. Then, plot twist, Cindy found out she could get pregnant, because she did. She and Carl went on to welcome a son named Alex to their happy little Brady Bunch. And while the children all got along really well, life on the farm was actually pretty hard for them. Carl was incredibly strict and expected a lot out of his children. They had hours worth of chores that they had to complete every single day. And on top of that, as punishment, if they ever misbehaved, Carl would give them extra like physical labor type jobs. And although all the children had their own set of feelings towards Carl and his rules, Levi in particular really seemed to harbor the most animosity towards his father. They seemed to butt heads more than anyone else in the family. And Levi always felt as though his father had particularly high expectations of him. The arguments, tension, and resentment all finally came to a head when Levi was 16. That's when he decided he could not take it anymore and he moved out of the Carlson's farmhouse. He dropped out of school and he bounced around from family member to family member in an effort to avoid his father. And for a while, Carl, Cindy, and the other three children really didn't hear or see much of him. In November 2002, tragedy would once again strike the Carlson family. Cindy and Carl were turning in for the night, just getting themselves tucked into bed, when Carl looked out their bedroom window and immediately demanded that Cindy call 911. As it would turn out, the Carlson's barn, which housed their prize-winning horse and her two babies, had gone up in flames. And sadly, despite efforts from first responders, all three horses succumbed to the flames and the barn was completely destroyed. 
This was devastating to the family. Not only was the loss of the horses difficult to take, but that barn was a piece of Carlson family history, and it was just gone. The only person who didn't seem emotionally affected by losing it was Carl. Rather, he just seemed eager to get everything cleaned up and to put the whole situation behind him. The fire was ultimately ruled an accident. However, the investigation did turn up some interesting information. Apparently, this wasn't the second devastating fire in Carl's life. It was the third. The first had not been the fire in 91. The first had actually taken place in 1986. At this time, Carl was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy when his brand new Ford Mustang went up in flames in his driveway. Lucky for him, he was able to collect $10,000 worth of insurance money from the fire, which he used to claw himself out of debt. Thankfully, he'd also removed all of his personal belongings from the car before it had spontaneously combusted in his driveway. So here we've got one man, three devastating fires, all taking place during points of financial hardship in his life, and all resulting in huge insurance payouts that happened to come just in time to save his ass. Mm-hmm. Did I mention that two weeks before the barn fire, Carl had actually upped his insurance policy on the barn from $20,000 to $115,000, all of which he collected at the close of the investigation? If not, he did. It's just a little suspicious. And you know who else thought so? Aside from every human with a functioning brain listening to this story right now, Levi. Levi actually approached Cindy and flat out told her that he thought his father was responsible for purposefully starting every single one of these fires, including the one that had killed his mother. And when Carl found out about this conversation, he was pissed. He confronted Levi and the two actually ended up in a fist fight over it. And after that fight, Levi left and once again tried to distance himself from his father. But over time, as life progressed, Levi did slowly start to reintegrate himself into the family. He got married and he and his wife had two daughters by the time he was 20. And my assumption is that he wanted the girl's grandparents and their extended family in their lives. So he put his issues aside and began to let his guard and his walls back down. He loved his daughters so much, and it was a sacrifice he was willing to make. He wanted nothing more than to be a good father and to provide for them. He got his GED, he got himself a good job with benefits to support them, and despite the fact that he and his wife eventually ended up separating, he did everything in his power to maintain a presence in those girls' lives. Sadly, though, Levi would not get to see his daughters grow up, because on November 20th, 2008, the unimaginable happened. That day, Levi was at the farm. He was working on an old truck. The front wheels had been removed and it was jacked up on a single railway jack. Cindy and Carl were getting ready to attend a funeral. And just before they left, Carl told Cindy that he wanted to run into the barn and check on Levi. New barn, I guess. And when he came back out a few moments later, he got in the car with Cindy and the two headed off. Everything seemed totally normal. It wasn't until they returned home hours later that Cindy immediately got the feeling that something was very, very wrong. When she and Carl pulled in the driveway, she realized that Levi's car was still at their house, but he should have been done with the truck and long gone by the time they returned home. So why was he still there? Carl agreed it seemed weird, so he volunteered to go into the barn and check on Levi. And as Cindy made her way into the house, She remembers seeing Carl frantically running towards her and screaming for her to call 911. When Cindy asked him what was wrong, he explained that the truck had fallen off of the jack and that it had crushed Levi. When emergency services arrived, Levi was rushed away in an ambulance, but sadly he was pronounced dead upon arrival at Geneva General Hospital. He was just 23 years old. He had his whole life in front of him. He had his children's whole lives in front of him. And in an instant, he was gone. There was a brief investigation into Levi's death. However, it was very quickly ruled just an extremely unfortunate accident. But at this point, those closest to Carl, the ones who knew just how many extremely unfortunate accidents had befallen him, yeah, they were starting to get a little bit more suspicious. Cindy in particular recalls Carl's reaction to Levi's death as being over the top, as if he was putting on a show. She claims he was throwing himself into walls and screaming. And while, yes, you'd expect hysterical emotion out of a parent who's just lost a child, Cindy just remembers it all as coming across as very disingenuous. It became even more alarming when Cindy found out that Carl had taken Levi to get a $700,000 life insurance policy just two weeks before his death. 
and a handwritten will left by Levi that had been notarized within 24 hours of the accident named the sole beneficiary to that policy as Carl. And as if that's not like fucked up enough, Levi was scheduled for a health assessment from the insurance company the day after he died. An assessment he very likely would have failed due to a chronic medical issue he suffered from, and the failure of this assessment would have resulted in the cancellation of this insurance policy. But because Levi never made it to the assessment, Carl was able to collect every cent of insurance money owed to him from Levi's death. Now, Levi was very specific that his intention was for his daughters to receive this money should anything ever happen to him. He'd only named his father as the beneficiary temporarily due to his pending divorce. But wouldn't you know it, Levi's daughters never saw a cent of that money. Carl instead irresponsibly pissed most of it away on a new business venture. You see, he had entrepreneurial dreams of raising gourmet ducks to sell to restaurants. So he bought like thousands of them to begin raising on his farm. And at this point, Carl's daughters, his wife, the community, they're all a little bit sketched out. Honestly, who wouldn't be sketched out by the crazy duck guy whose shit keeps burning down? I would be. I feel like it's worth mentioning here that there is a lot of speculation around Cindy and how much she actually knew, because Carl told most of his family that Levi had barely left enough money behind to cover his own funeral, yet Cindy did know about the real amount that Carl got from Levi's insurance plan. So some people think that maybe she was in on the whole thing. But Carl's daughters seem to believe that she's innocent, so who am I to discount those beliefs? They were there and lived it, I wasn't and didn't, so I'll take their word for it. As Carl continued to blast through the money that was left from Levi's insurance policy, and he and Cindy's finances began to get tighter and tighter, Cindy started to fear for her own life. This man clearly has no allegiance or emotional connection to anyone, so why should she feel safe? Eventually, this fear got the best of her, and she decided to hire a private investigator. She wanted to see if there was anything else worth digging up on Carl, and, uh, boy was there. The private investigator found out that Carl had recently taken out an insurance policy on Cindy to the tune of $1.2 million. So something tells me that she was not long for this world. And she became so consumed with fear that she ended up leaving Carl in the farmhouse. She moved out and tried to put as much distance between she and her husband as she possibly could, at least while she tried to figure everything out. Luckily for her, around the same time, enough suspicion had been brought to police regarding Levi's death that they'd actually decided to reopen his case. They contacted Cindy and I guess kind of propositioned her. Basically, they were hoping that they could team up and take this SOB down. And Cindy took to her role of informant very eagerly. She went out on her own volition and purchased an audio recorder so that she could record her conversations with Carl. She was really hopeful that she'd be able to get him to confess to what he'd done on tape and that he'd then be arrested, which would likely save her life. So she set up a meeting with Carl and she told him that if he could be a man and admit to every single lie he'd ever told her, that she might consider taking him back. A fresh slate agreement of sorts. Tell me everything there is to tell, and maybe we can start over. And according to Cindy, it worked. He admitted everything, and she had it on tape. She had in her possession a literal smoking gun. She left the restaurant and hightailed it to the police station. She busted in the front doors and she was like, shut it down, I cracked the case. I've got it, book them. But when they actually listened to the tape, everyone's excitement fell down about 190% because the so-called confession was completely inaudible. The restaurant had simply been too loud, and Carl and Cindy's conversation, confession or not, was completely unintelligible. While they were disheartened, sure, police weren't just going to throw in the towel. If he'd confessed once, maybe they could get him to do it again. But this time, it'd be in a setting of their choosing, with professional-grade recording equipment and undercover officers surrounding them. This time, they would make sure it was foolproof. And Cindy was able to get Carl to meet again. However, this time he was visibly uncomfortable and suspicious of Cindy, which I get. According to her, he's already told her all of this stuff. So why is she having him detail it all again, point by point? I'd be weirded out. And provided he really did confess the first time, the second time around, his story changed. Part of me feels like I'm walking into a booby trap. How am I going to set a trap? Do you want to go through my purse? I asked you if you pushed the truck, and you said yes. I didn't push the truck, I said. 
I said, I did nothing to do, but I said, I took advantage of the situation once it happened. And that is exactly what it said to me. Carl, you told me that you didn't set it up that way, but when you were in there, you saw the opportunity. No, after it had happened, then I panicked and saw the opportunity. I mean, did it fall hard, or? No. I mean, you just, you just oh, had to bump it? Yeah. I mean, because it's, it's so wobbly, you know, because the only thing that's touching the ground is just the back two wheels. Left. I mean, what, did he make a noise at one instant? I thought, I mean, you think. Even though they didn't walk away with like a signed confession from this man, as you can hear, they also didn't walk away that day completely empty handed. They at least had enough of a reason to call him into the station for an interview. So they did just that. On November 23rd, 2012, Carl sat down with investigators and it went poorly. For starters, when asked if he knew why he was there, he responded with, yeah, you want to talk about my dead wife and my dead son. Shit, if you ask me, cuff him right there, because who the fuck talks about their family like that? Disgusting. But despite this, investigators kept the conversation as cordial as they could for as long as they could. It wasn't until they started asking questions that Carl found difficult to answer that things officially shifted from interview to criminal interrogation. Regardless of the tone of the conversation, though, Carl's favorite thing to talk about unwaveringly seemed to be himself. He gave police a complete and total play-by-play -play of basically his entire life the audio version of his autobiography that quite literally no one asked for. He also whined incessantly about his back pain, spending the entire interview standing up and sitting back down and repositioning, telling investigators that they just had no idea how hard it was to live with his back pain. Just a lot of woe is me, my life is so hard, please feel bad for me type garbage. And that's when detectives realized that feigning the sympathy that Carl so obviously desperately wanted might just be the exact way to wear him down. So they abandoned the hard-ass investigator narrative and set out to become Carl Carlson's new two-man pity party. They softened their demeanor and just really laid it on thick with two Cs. Thick. And sure enough, nine hours into the interrogation, Carl confessed. Ish. <coughs> I'll walk with you, and I'll walk with you. Was it just a split second thing? Never heard him. Open the truck door. Okay. So open the truck door because they had to get inside to move the linkage for the truck. And when I did it, it didn't just. But you see, Carl was gone. We've gone from he was dead. He walked in there, and now we found when you opened the door. So take the final step. There is no more. I stepped in the truck in the thing, you know. And I was just scared. I don't know why. Following this revelation, he was arrested and charged with murder and insurance fraud. And despite the story he had given them, investigators were sure that Carl had deliberately set that vehicle up to fall on his son. That he had precariously jacked it up and rammed into it with all the force he could manage to ensure it would happen. Ensure that Levi would never come out from under that truck. And ensure that he would receive his $700,000 payday. I told you, this guy sucks. But remember, this doesn't stop at Levi. Christina's death also needed to be reevaluated. That became abundantly clear when Carl made this stupid, arrogant remark. There's nothing that can justify killing your wife, your kids, your, your uncles, your parents, your... I mean, it'd be, different, it'd be different if you killed the... I didn't say you killed your wife. No, I know, but I'm just saying, you know, I mean, that's why I'm saying wife, kids, whatever. Carl, did well, you? No. No, I've already been through that. No, hell no, and no way in hell. Probably should have leaned heavier on that whole right to remain silent thing, eh, pal? The problem was that Carl had told so many lies over the years that he couldn't even keep them straight anymore. He tried to cover his ass, but he just kept digging himself in deeper and deeper. Not to mention that thanks to Christina's cousins, there was literal video proof of some of his lies. 
So was there a window in the back? There was one that was like extremely, extremely, extremely small. Well, the window was like that big and it was boarded up. But you couldn't fit out of it. You couldn't put, you might be able to put a baby out of it. A baby. You and I are a 80 pound woman. There's no way. When police finally went back and started looking into the reports from 1991, they were shocked at just how much incriminating information they found, especially Carl Kent and Ken Buskey's reports. Remember, both of their reports contained plenty of details suggesting that the fire had been purposefully started by a person and not as some freak accident. In fact, these men so deeply believed that Carl should be held responsible for what had happened that they had kept everything, every note, file, recording, and hypothesis they'd ever made. They kept it all with them, even through retirement, for 21 years. But despite everything that had come to light since Christina's death, for some reason, California still was not budging. So how does one get things to happen faster than they're happening naturally? You guessed it, the media. And this story became a media sensation. Seemingly overnight, the case went from a back and forth between New York and California to a nationwide headline. To the point where California basically had no choice but to take action against Carl. But just as things began to come to a head, Carl made his own move. In one last power play in November of 2013, rather than attend a trial and risk the outcome of the opinion of a jury of his peers, Carl Carlson pled guilty to the second degree murder of his son, Levi. My guess is that he was hoping if he pled guilty to this, that everything else would kind of fall to the wayside. So he stood in court and stoically confessed to not only dangerously jacking up the truck and subsequently pushing it over onto his son, but he shocked and appalled everyone when he explained that Levi had actually survived the initial impact of the truck and that he knowingly left his son there, alive, terrified, and slowly dying. He showed no remorse for his actions, and he was sentenced to 15 years to life in New York. But his family and Christina's family were not willing to let that be the end. They pushed for California to move forward in reopening Christina's case, and 29 years after the fire, the district attorney charged Carl Carlson with the murder of his wife. The prosecutor painted Carl very accurately as the greedy, heartless monster he is, she detailed for the jury point by point not only Christina's murder, but the barn fire, the truck fire, and Levi's murder. And if all that wasn't damning enough, she then called a small army of witnesses to testify against Carl. This included his own remaining children, Christina's sister Colette, and Carl Kent and Ken Buskey. And after 13 days of testimony and eight hours of deliberation, the jury returned and found Carl Holger Carlson guilty of first degree murder. In a sweet moment of serendipity, the verdict was actually handed down on Levi's 35th birthday. Not surprisingly, Carl showed no emotion when the verdict was read. Instead, he stood up and allowed himself to be escorted out of the courtroom without so much as a glance in the direction of his daughters. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And thank God, because following his sentence, it came to light that Cindy was not the only person that Carl had taken insurance policies out on before Johnny Law came knocking at the door. This lunatic had also taken out policies on his granddaughters. Yes, Levi's daughters. He sucks. When she found out about them, Cindy terminated the policies as fast as she possibly could. She wanted to make sure that there was nothing hanging over anyone's heads anymore. And with that, Carl Carlson will remain in prison in New York for his 15-year term before he's transferred to California to serve out his life sentence for Christina's murder. Unless, of course, his current in-the-works appeals are successful, which, God, I hope not. He deserves every second of that life sentence. Am I right? Anyways, that about wraps it up for today. Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story, especially if you made it to the end of this one. I know it was long, so if you're here, you're the best. Before you head out, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. I know it seems like a small gesture, but it really does help out the channel a lot, so thanks in advance. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel down below. I put out new true crime or creepy history content each week, and I would love to catch you back here in my next video. Until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye, guys.